How wild was the Wild West? Were gunfights really a daily occurrence, or is that just a byproduct of Hollywood and the dime novels? As I'm sure you can imagine, the answer is somewhat complicated. Hell, I even had to bust out a calculator. First, though, I think it's important to clarify what we mean when we say the Wild West. And truth be told, there's not really a definitive answer. It just kind of depends on what you're envisioning. For instance, the era of the cowboy, at least in regard to the large cattle drives, was pretty short-lived, roughly from 1865 to 1895. Likewise for the so-called Indian Wars. Out west, for the most part, the major conflicts between the indigenous and the U.S. Army wouldn't kick off until after the Civil War. And they were effectively over just two decades later with the surrender of Geronimo. Or maybe you're thinking of the mountain men. Once again, very short-lived. We're talking from circa 1820 to around 1840. Now, me personally, I tend to think of the Old West as just being the entirety of the 19th century west of the Mississippi River. I know that's a very broad, sweeping, oversimplified definition. It's not perfect, but hey, it works for me. The question still remains, though. How do you go about determining how deadly the Wild West was? How do you even quantify that? I mean, think about it. How often did fur trappers ride out into the high lonesome, never to be seen again? How many crow fell to the Blackfeet? How many Blackfeet fell to the Nez Perce? And what were the casualties like between the Comanche and the Spaniards? How likely was it for someone crossing the prairie to be ambushed by hostiles? How many homesteaders were murdered over their claims out in the middle of nowhere, their bodies never discovered? How many outlaws fought amongst themselves and simply left their victims in a shallow grave? Toss in the gold rush, the expansion of the railroad, decades of intertribal warfare, a whole hell of a lot of human trafficking, and the migration west to Oregon, and honestly, I wouldn't even know where to start in trying to figure out how wild or deadly the Old West truly was. It really just boils down to where you were, at what time period, and what you were doing. For example, it was much safer to be a blacksmith in the town of Tombstone in 1880 than it was being a fur trapper in North Dakota in the early 1820s. Or at least I would assume. Full disclosure. I do not have any hard numbers to back up that hypothesis I just shared, at least not in regards to blacksmiths or North Dakota in the 1820s. That said, when it comes to places like the aforementioned Tombstone or Deadwood or even Dodge City, we do have some pretty decent insights, mostly thanks to a 2017 study I found conducted by the University of Ohio. Long story short, they discovered that while gunfights were not a daily, weekly, or even a monthly occurrence, the homicide rates were still very high, not only by today's standards, but also when compared to the rest of the United States during the 19th century. Now, this study looked at the available data from Texas, Oregon, British Columbia, a few counties in Arizona, Colorado, and California, as well as eight native groups, also in California, five mining towns, and finally, five cattle towns, including the infamous Dodge City. So obviously, they didn't study crime rates for every single settlement west of the Mississippi, but they did have quite a bit of information to work from. And if you don't mind, I'm going to very briefly read directly from the study. Quote, To appreciate how violent the West was, we need to consider not only the annual homicide rate, but the risk of being murdered over time. For instance... The adult residents of Dodge City faced a homicide rate of at least 165 per 100,000 adults per year, meaning that 0.165% of the population was murdered each year, between a fifth and a tenth of a percent. That may sound small, but it is large to a criminologist or an epidemiologist, because it means that an adult who lived in Dodge City from 1876 to 1885 faced at least a 1 in 61 chance of being murdered. 1.65% of the population was murdered in those 10 years. An adult who lived in San Francisco between 1850 and 1865 faced at least a 1 in 203 chance of being murdered. And in the eight other counties in California that have been studied to date, at least a 1 in 72 chance. Even in Oregon from 1850 to 1865, which had the lowest minimum rate yet discovered in the American West, 30 per 100,000 adults per year, an adult faced a 1 in 208 chance of being murdered, end quote. Now, just for context, currently, as of this recording, in present-day Dodge City, Kansas, you've got a 1 in 247 chance 
of being a victim of violent crime. And that's all violent crime, not just murder. The murder rate is a 0.04%, so way lower than the 0.165% from Dodge in the latter part of the 19th century. In other words, just by crunching the numbers on the murder rate, Dodge City, Kansas is less violent and less deadly now in the year of our Lord 2024 than it was during its heyday as a rough cow town. But that's just Dodge City. What about everywhere else? Returning to the study, quote, If we assume the towns and counties that have been studied to date were representative of similar towns and counties, and that their inhabitants were a fair sample of the inhabitants of similar towns or counties, we can also be confident, because of the laws of probability, that homicide rates were high in towns and counties that have not yet been studied. For instance, we can estimate that there is only a 1 in 200 chance that the homicide rate for all western cattle towns was less than 97 per 100,000 adults per year. If the five cattle towns studied to date were typical, as there is every reason to believe, the chance that the rate in all cattle towns was low or moderate by the standards of most of the rest of the United States and other western nations, 10 per 100,000 adults per year or less, is vanishingly small, end quote. Now, just digging further, we'll once again use Dodge City as an example. The homicide rate in Dodge City just for the year 1880 alone was 100.4 per 100,000 citizens, whereas the homicide rate for the entirety of the United States in the year 2016 was just 5.3 per 100,000. So just those numbers alone makes it seem as if Dodge was just through the roof violent in 1880, right? Well, what if I were to tell you that only one person was killed there in Dodge in all of 1880? Just one. The catch is that the population was only comprised of 996 souls. So just that one violent death caused the murder rate to jump from 0 per 100,000 to 100 per 100,000. Even during Dodge's most violent year, there were only five killings. Hell, according to historian Marshall Trimble, between the years of 1870 and 1875, there were only 45 violent deaths total in the cow towns of Dodge, Abilene, Ellsworth, Wichita, and Caldwell combined. For another historian, Randolph Roth, Gila County, Arizona, between the years of 1880 and 1884, had a rate of 156 killings per 100,000. Bodie, California had a rate of 116 per 100,000, and the boomtown of Deadwood eclipsed them all with a homicide rate of 442 per 100,000 adults during just its first seven months. Similar results can be found in Tombstone, where during their most homicidal year, just like Dodge City, they only experienced five violent deaths. Compare that to modern-day Houston, Texas where in the year 2023, they had 344 murders. The only difference is that Houston has a population of over 2.3 million, whereas there were only 973 people living in Tombstone in 1880. Now, I'm no statistician, but I did find a calculator online that determines homicide rates. And according to the numbers I just shared, Houston, Texas, in the year 2023, had a murder rate of 14 per 100,000. Using the same calculator and crunching the numbers from Tombstone in 1880, even though they only experienced five killings, the murder rate was much, much higher. Check this out. With a population of 973 and five killings, that means mathematically that Tombstone's murder rate was 513 per 100,000 residents, as opposed to Houston's 14 per 100,000. You see what I'm saying, right? Currently, as we speak, the city of New Orleans has the highest murder rate in all of the United States, 58.4 per 100,000 residents, and is still way less than the murder rate in Tombstone in 1880, even though Tombstone only experienced five killings. I hope this isn't too confusing. Yes, there are way more murders nowadays in New Orleans and Houston, but compared with the populations of towns like Dodge City and Tombstone, you were still more likely to die a violent death back then than you are now. At least if I'm understanding these numbers correctly, math is not my strong suit, which is why I'm using that damn calculator. Now, just for fun, let's compare Tombstone in 1880 with present-day Colima, Mexico, which, according to Statistica.com, is currently the deadliest city in the world with a murder rate of 140.2 per 100,000. 
Remember what I just said about math, and please keep in mind that I know absolutely nothing about statistics. But if I'm not mistaken, it sounds like Colima, Mexico, while being almost two and a half times deadlier than modern day New Orleans, is still not as deadly as the towns of Tombstone and Deadwood were back in their heyday. Now, there was another study I found on frontier crime statistics conducted by political economist Matthew Coutinier. According to him, most of the violence in the Old West was concentrated in areas where resources were limited, kind of like mining towns like Tombstone or cow towns like Dodge City. Hell, even during the Range Wars, what were they fighting over? The limited resources of grass and water, right? To quote Mr. Coutinier, we're talking about a 3 to 4% increase in crime in counties with minerals and no federal control compared to those with no minerals and which were incorporated into the United States, end quote. Another thing to keep in mind are the demographics of the Old West. Per the 1880 U.S. Census, men between the ages of 18 to 25 made up the majority of the population on the frontier. And I probably don't have to tell you this, but men between the ages of 18 to 25 are just a tad more prone to violence and other dangerous behavior. Indeed, it's this demographic, even nowadays, that's responsible for the majority of the homicides. So long story short, like I said earlier, it really just boils down to when and where. A mining town with limited resources, which just so happened to also be populated mostly with young men between the ages of 18 to 25, would have been far more dangerous than your more established cities like Austin or St. Louis. So no, gunfights were not as widespread or numerous as depicted in the movies. Hell, in a lot of towns in the Old West, you weren't even allowed to carry a weapon within city limits. That said, the numbers just don't lie. In certain places like Tombstone and Deadwood and Dodge City, the murder rate was much higher in the Old West than it was in the rest of the United States at that time. And it was much higher in the Old West than even in the most violent cities nowadays. And by the way, everything you just heard was inspired by listener C. Far and Wide on YouTube. His original question goes as follows, quote, I just went through an old mining town here in Utah called Eureka. Legend is, as far as mining towns go, it was a very calm and civilized place. The history of other towns just a bit further south claimed that there was an average of two murders per day. I know it's impossible to get a true figure, but it still makes me wonder, how common were murders in old towns like that? Was it really a daily occurrence, or has that been exaggerated through the centuries? End quote. And see far and wide, that is your real name. And if you're still listening, I hope I helped to shed at least a little bit of a light on the homicide rate in the Old West. Now that said, despite certain areas for sure being really dangerous, most places weren't. And oftentimes, the reputations of a lot of these old towns have definitely been blown way out of proportion. I'm reminded of a place I was researching a while back known as Canyon Diablo. It's a ghost town nowadays, but story goes that Canyon Diablo was the toughest hellhole in all of the West. Got its start as a railroad town and quickly filled up with numerous saloons, whorehouses, and gambling joints. All catering to the rail workers as well as your usual criminal types who were drawn to such out-of-the-way locales. And just to give you an idea of how deadly Canyon Diablo was, the first town marshal was sworn in at 3 p.m. and buried that very same day at 8 p.m. What's more, the local Boot Hill boasted of 36 graves, 35 of which were the result of violent deaths. At least that's how the story goes. In all reality, there's no evidence for any of that. It all comes from the imagination of a fiction author named Gladwell Richardson. Of course, that doesn't stop people from telling the stories over and over again, and before long, people get to thinking that Canyon Diablo, in addition to having a really cool name, was also one of the deadliest towns in the Old West. Now, there was a fairly exciting shootout there in Canyon Diablo in the year 1905, which resulted in one death, but I'm not aware of any other gunfights occurring there, nor am I aware of any evidence supporting any of those other claims. So yeah, be careful believing the stories. There were certain areas in the Old West where your life expectancy could drop a substantial amount, but most of the stories are just that, stories. So thank you, see far and wide. If you're a new listener to the Wild West Extravaganza, this is where we talk all things Old West history related. Normally, each episode focuses on just one person or event from the Wild West, but today I thought I'd change things up a little and answer a few listener questions. 
The next of which comes to us from Brandon Davis, 6078. Brandon asks, do you think cowboys on the trail or in a bunkhouse share toenail clippers? No, Brandon, I do not. And I'll tell you why. I think they use pocket knives to trim both their fingernails and their toenails, just like my dad does. And as far as I'm concerned, no self-respecting cowboy would ever be without a pocket knife. Nor would one stoop so low as to admit they didn't have a pocket knife by asking to borrow someone else's. In all seriousness, I do think this would make a great topic for Santee over at YouTube's Arizona Ghost Riders channel. As to the historical use of toenail clippers in bunkhouses, I honestly haven't got a clue. Sorry. Next, we've got the Banjo Outlaw asking about Billy the Kid. Quote, Let's talk about the Indian note that Billy the Kid supposedly left behind in a shell casing and left in a cave. It was wrote on cigarette paper, I believe. I've never found any more information on that except for the little excerpt in Bob Bose Bell's book on him. End quote. Well, Banjo Outlaw, you may have already found it, but I do have an episode on this note. It's titled Billy the Kid's Last Stand. Link down below if you'd like to give it a listen. And if anyone else isn't familiar with what we're talking about, what Banjo's referring to is a note discovered years ago, I want to say maybe in the 1940s or 1950s, and it was written on cigarette paper, rolled up and stuffed inside of an empty cartridge. It read as follows. This is our last shell, and about 10 Indians left, so our chances look slim. But we are going to take a chance. Yours truly, William Bonney. End quote. While I do find the note really cool, I'm not really sure if anyone's ever going to be able to prove that it was actually written by Billy the Kid. Apparently, the handwriting does match, but whether or not it's authentic, who knows? It is fun to think about, though. And according to the internet, it did sell at auction back in 2019 for a whopping $3,025. Now for a question I've been asked numerous times over the past few years. XX Elusive Man XX 1046 wants to know if I play RDR2. And no, I'm sad to say that I do not, but I kind of want to. For everyone else listening, if you're drawing a blank, RDR2 is short for Red Dead Redemption 2, a video game described by Wikipedia as being a 2018 action adventure game developed and published by Rockstar Games. The game is the third entry in the Red Dead series and a prequel to the 2010 game Red Dead Redemption. The story is set in a fictionalized representation of the United States in 1899 and follows the exploits of Arthur Morgan, an outlaw and member of the Vanderland Gang, who must deal with the decline of the Wild West while attempting to survive government forces, rival gangs, and other adversaries. Here's the deal, man. When I was younger, I was really into video games. Halo, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, stuff like that. But sometime around, I don't know, maybe 2008, 2009, it just stopped being fun. And I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, I don't play video games because I'm too cool. It's not that at all. It's just for whatever reason, I don't know what it was, it got boring. Also, full disclosure, I was never very good at it. I'd play online with friends, coworkers, and I was always constantly just getting my ass annihilated. Now, at that time, Red Dead Redemption Part 2 was not out yet. And by the time it did come out, I don't even think I had a gaming system. And I currently do not have a gaming system. Supposedly, they're making a Part 3, though. And I think maybe when that's released, I might just go ahead and break down and get a PlayStation and see what's up. Really, it just comes down to free time, something that I have very little of currently. So we'll see. I'll tell you what, though, I'm going to make it a point at some time this year to at very least watch a playthrough of Red Dead 2. You know, all the cutscenes or whatever you call them, just so I can get a good idea of the storyline, which, from what I've been told, is actually pretty good. All right. And finally, question of the year comes from DKIM8164, who asks, would you rather fight an angry brown bear with a Bowie knife or a tomahawk? And the answer is Bowie knife. No question. I feel like with a tomahawk, my only option would be to club the son of a bitch over the head, or if I'm lucky, maybe I could sever a paw or something like that. At least with a Bowie knife, I could really get in there and carve him up. I might not win. Matter of fact, I probably won't. But damn it, I'm going to make sure that bear is at least walking funny for a few days. All right. 
And if you too would like to walk funny, I would suggest following the Wild West extravaganza wherever you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Pretty much every place other than SoundCloud, because I am not a 17-year-old mumble rapper. If you'd like to hear more true tales from the Old West, head on over to wildwestextra.com. And while you're there, hit that contact button. Let me know what's on your mind. Sorry for going radio silent last week. There was a ton of stuff going on, so I was not able to record. But fear not, we're coming back stronger than ever next week with the tale of lesser-known gunfighter Dangerous Dan Tucker. Trust me when I say this is a story you do not want to miss. Okay, one final announcement. I'd like to officially welcome and introduce to you a new member of the team here at the Wild West Extravaganza, our new editor, Christina Lumagi. Bringing Christina on has been an absolute game changer as it frees me up to work on new content rather than just sitting around editing, which just so you know is my least favorite part of this entire process. So please extend a very warm welcome to Christina. She too is a podcaster, by the way, as well as a fellow lover of history. So if you get a chance, check out her show, Historia's Unknown, all about obscure Latin American history. And if you'd like to get your scare on, Christina is also the host of East Spooky Tales, which focuses on Latin American folklore, myths, legends, and haunted places. <laughs> That's Historia's Unknown and East Spooky Tales. Links to both down below. Until next time, try not to bring a tomahawk to a bear fight. Don't go sharing your toenail clippers. And if you stumble upon a time machine, it might not be a good idea to travel back to Tombstone in 1880. Adios.